Well, good evening. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this event. A special welcome to Ines Cantor of the Boston Celtics and to Neil Swidey, who is with the Boston Globe magazine and a tough alumnus. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thanks also to Ed DeMore, a member of the IGL Advisory Board, for making tonight's event possible. We appreciate your support and the engagement of the board. I'm pleased that the Tisch College of Civic Life is a co-sponsor of this event and that Alan Solomon, uh, the Dean, is present. And sincere thanks to the IGL team for their hard work in organizing this event. The Institute for Global Leadership prepares new generations of critical thinkers who can provide the effect needed to help solve the world's most difficult problems. IGL's programs offer unique opportunities for tough students to make a difference in the world. It is auspicious that Ines Kanda uh, is here tonight as we recognize the achievements of the Tufts women's and men's basketball teams. Both are seeded number one in this weekend's NESCAC tournaments, both of which Tufts will be hosting at the Cousins Gymnasium. The women are coming off their first undefeated season in the program's history. So we... so we want to wish them both much success and a place in the NCAA tournament. At this point, I would like to invite Sophia Rose, a sophomore guard on this year's team, to present Inez with a Tufts oh. Jumbo shirt. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Should we take a picture? Um, anybody taking a picture? I guess not. I got it. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. So go Jumbos. <laughs> Finally, I would like to invite Connor Doyle, a member of the class of 2021 and an IGL student to introduce Innes and Neil. Connor? Thank you, Professor Williams. Hi everyone, my name is Connor Doyle and I'm a junior studying international relations and Arabic. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing speakers for tonight's event. Before I do so, I'd first like to thank the Institute for Global Leadership for fostering experiential learning through opportunities across Tufts campus. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Ennis Cantor, an MBA center for the Boston Celtics. Drafted as the third pick in the 2011 NBA draft, he played for the Utah Jazz between 2011 and 2015. Prior to joining the Celtics, Mr. Cantor played for the Portland Trailblazers, where they made it to the <laughs> where they made it to the conference finals last year. He also played for the Oklahoma City Thunder and New York Knicks. <laughs> Ennis was born in Switzerland. <laughs> Enes was born in Switzerland to Turkish parents and uh, spent the formative years of his childhood in Turkey. Mr. Cantor came over to the United States at age 17 to further his basketball career. This move paid off, and he spent a year at the University of Kentucky before declaring for the NBA draft. Over the course of his career, Mr. Cantor has been an activist, working to help people and speaking out against injustice. Last summer, he hosted 50 camps in 30 states for kids that went beyond teaching basketball to include nutrition, anti-bullying, and lessons of respecting one another. He established a scholarship fund for first-generation college students and children of first responders killed in the line of duty, and worked with uh, food rescue operations in Oklahoma City to provide food for at-risk youth during the holiday season. 
Mr. Cantor is also planning on opening a charter, charter school in the Oklahoma City metro area that focuses on serving low-income minority students and those from immigrant families who speak limited English. It is my pleasure welcoming here, him here this evening. <laughs> Moderating tonight's discussion is alumnus Neil Swidey. Neil Swati is a best-selling author and award-winning Boston Globe magazine staff writer. His most recent book, Trapped Under the Sea, was named one of the best books of the year by Amazon and Booklist. He's also the author of The Assist, named one of the best books of the year by The Washington Post, and co-author of Last Lion, The Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy. His writing has been featured in Best American Science Writing, The Best American Crime Writing, and The Best American Political Writing. He now teaches journalism at Brandeis University. At the outgrowth of his first book, he founded the All Ray Scholars Program, a mentoring and scholarship nonprofit that gives low-income Boston students a second chance at college. Please give them both a warm welcome. Thanks very much, Connor. Thank and thank you, you yes. Inez. Uh, well, I wasn't planning to start with this, but because we have the yes. uh, undefeated... Uh, uh, I haven't got an invite, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't get an invite yet. Yes, where's the invite, friend? I'm so start waiting for now. my invite. Okay. Um, you wrote recently uh, in Time Magazine a piece about pay equity for the WNBA. Yes. Can you explain just uh, for the audience what motivated you, right. you to do that? I mean. First of all, that issue was what been you know bothered me for since I started playing uh, basketball. I feel like you know the the you know they don't get the same uh, attention that they deserve. They don't get the same uh, you know uh, they just I, I, that was been bothering me for like for eight nine years, and I wanted to write it. And just because I had the platform, I told my friend in Time at magazine, I was like, hey, I want to write something about you know the equal pay. And, um, you know, once I write the uh, article, I, of course, I had, you know, so many haters out there. And I was just saying, hey, no, it's, it's not seriously. It was just, it was crazy. It was like, oh, yeah, you, you cannot compare this to that. You cannot compare Jordan and this. I give him a really quick, quick you know, uh, example. I was like, okay, you know, Michael Jordan, flu game. It's obviously one of the most legendary, you mm -hmm. know, moments that we, we always heard. But not many people know that. You know, Skyler was Skyler thing is playing and pregnant in whole season, 2018 season, mm -hmm. and not not many people talking about that stuff. You know, because uh, for me, so I was like, you know what, I have to talk about that stuff. So for for me, I was like, you know what, just because I have the platform, I need to bring this to uh, to our audience. And um, I just we were we were just in LA a few days ago, and um, and Kobe's memorial, and then some of like the legends came there and speak like Donald the Taurasi and stuff. It just amazed me and I was like, you know what? What I did was right. I feel like they, they don't get the attention that they, they, that they, they deserve. And uh, so I feel like just more, more uh, players need to step up and uh, talk, uh, talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. And um, at least you get new haters from the haters you normally have, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. It like, I'm not, not from the Celtics, not from the Celtics, but even like some of the NBA players will like tell them, it's like, hey, this is wild. What you're talking about is crazy. Of course, they are not going to make the same money, whatever. But I'm like, I give them a, a very quick example. I'm like, look at what happened to U.S. women uh, soccer team. Right, they won the world well, the champion, and they don't get the same credit or the attention that you know men's uh, soccer team does. So mm -hmm. I was like, they were pretty shocked that the the, the exams I, I come up with, but you know, in the end, I'm trying to speak the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. So you came here at 17. To, yes. What were your first impressions of this country? You came to play basketball and. There were yeah. complications with doing that, but what were your just impressions of the country itself? I was kind of lost because I did not know English, you know, at, at all. The food was different, the culture was different, religion was different, everything was different, you know. For, so first couple of months, I, was, I had a really hard time adjusting all that stuff. But and then, you know, it just I was like, this is going to be my home from now on. And then I was like, I was trying to really force myself to just, you know, just really be be American, I'll say. I was mm -hmm. going to McDonald's. I was watching, <laughs> so, seriously, I was watching. I asked one of my friends, I was like, hey, where, where can I learn the you know, street language? He said, there's a show 
called Jersey Shore. <laughs> so yes, yeah. so just, I was like, start watching that show and you gotta pick it up like this. I'm like, okay. So I went to my, I was in college, I went to my dorm and started watching Jersey Shore for the first time and I was like, this is so, I don't want to say, this is so crazy. I don't want to say, oh, this is so crazy, but now it's like, yeah. crazy is Yeah, next thing I know, I was in a tanning bed. I'm joking, but uh, <laughs> I'm actually really cool, cool friends with uh, Mike the situation right now. I know oh, really? it sounds very weird, but like we talk on Twitter and we text each other and stuff. No, seriously, Mark, the situation so it's like a very weird dude. Uh, you, you came to play prep school, um, yes. and then you couldn't because of a shoe contract, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I, one of the biggest reasons that I you know, came to America because well, I, well, in Turkey, you cannot really go to school and play basketball at the same time. You have to pick one, either education or sport. So I wanted to do both. I wanted to you know, go to college, get my education, and play basketball at the same time. So that was one of the biggest reasons that um, you know, I came to America, but just because of, I was professional. I, I played professional in, in Turkey, I had a shoe deal and stuff, so that's why they said you're not really uh, allowed to play yeah. here. So no, I couldn't play high school or I couldn't play college. Yeah, it must have been crazy. So you're watching just the Jersey Shore, it just was, waiting for it to happen? Or? <laughs> no, it was, it was tough because NCAA rules are like the craziest rules, man. Just because now I'm done with college and everything, I can't say it. It's like, yeah. it's like a dictatorship. It's crazy. It the NCAA, I hate the NCAA rules because I'm talking about the sports because like, it's, I mean, for me, I turned down lots of lots of money to just come here and go to school and play basketball at the same time. But just because I had a you know, shoe deal, they said you cannot play college basketball ever. And they told me I, I'm not even allowed to practice with the, the team anymore. So the, co the you know, coach, Coach Cal, Coach Calipari in Kentucky made my assistant coach. So I was the youngest assistant coach in NCAA history. And just yeah. trying, to, <laughs> trying to press so I can practice with, with, my, with my teammates. So I couldn't play high school, I couldn't play college. And then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to draft, right? And I got drafted, I'm like, finally, I'm gonna get to play basketball in America. Then lockout happened in 2011. Yeah. So like no high school, no college, no NBA. I'm like, this is getting wild. I'm not gonna play basketball. <laughs> I, should, I should go back to Turkey. I was thinking about that, but uh, then lockout was over in December, yeah. then I was fine. So what do you make of reforming the NCAA? Uh, uh, you, you see it now, you see all the, all the uh, crazy uh, decisions and control that's mm. kind of embedded in it and yeah. the people who get caught, the students and their families who get caught up in it. Uh, we, we see something going on right now with the likenesses, you know, the, the court cases that have started out in LA and other things happening. Do, do you, do you, are you optimistic that, 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 kind of, that that power structure can be changed? I mean, I hope so. I mean, because like NCAA itself making billions and billions, you know, but the, the, the rules that they put is just, it's terrible, terrible. And um, I hope it will change one day because I mean, lots of um, international players are scared to come to America and play college basketball because of all this, all these rules. Right. Um, moving ahead to sort of how you balance now basketball and activism. Uh, you told me before that you have friends, when you started to get a little more public about things, friends in the NBA who said, don't do this, man, mm -hmm. just, just shut <clears throat> up, play, cash your checks. Um, wh where does that come from? What, is, what does activism look like in the locker room when we're not around? What are people saying? I mean, for those who don't know, so it's, I'll, I'll say this, I feel really blessed in America because we have, we have freedom, we have democracy here, we have human rights, and. Uh, and people respect each other, but it's sadly we don't have any of those in my country, in Turkey. So that's why, just because I have the platform, I'm trying to talk about some of the issues going on in my country. Of course, it affected me and my uh, family. So, you know, once I start, when I started talking about these conversations, it was like five, six, six uh, years ago. And um, of course, you know, just of course it affected me and my uh, family. I remember it was, um, I think it was 2000, uh, 2015, that was the last time I was back in Turkey. And, and then after that, I, I left Turkey, and, um, and then things are just got more heated, and then I couldn't, and Turkish, actually, government revoked my passport. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was a genetic professor, and he got fired from his job. 
It's just because if I talk about these issues, you know, just, just talk, nothing else. And, uh, you know, my sister went to medical school for six years. Now she cannot find a job because of the last name. My actual little, little brother, I have two brothers. One, one of my, uh, you know, little brother was playing basketball in Turkey, and he, he literally got kicked out of every basketball team just because I, I talk about these issues. And, um, you know, my f other family members would keep getting fired, and my family had to put a statement out there and said, we are disowned in Ennis, and they made it publicly. And um, after that, I remember going to practice. It was the, probably the most awkward, most weirdest day, uh, most emotional day in my uh, career, basketball career. And then, uh, and actually, the Turkish government really didn't believe in that. And uh, they sent police to my house in Turkey, and they raided the whole house. And they took every electronics away, phones away, computers away, laptops away. They wanted to see if I am still in contact with my family or not. And if they would see any, you know, text message, any missed calls, any, you know, uh, email, they will be all in trouble. So it's even hard to communicate with my, you know, uh, family. And, um, you know, of course, just because of it's so public, my team is asking me the question that were, whichever team I go to, are you crazy? You know, why you, talk, why you keep talking about these issues? I mean, because they just tell me, hey, you're an NBA player, just excuse my language, just shut your mouth, make your money and just live a happy life. And your family over there is still getting affected. But I was telling them, I was like, hey, look, my family is only one. There are thousands of families out there. Their situation is way worse than mine. You guys know my story because I play in NBA, right? And um, so that's why when I sit down and talk to them like that one-on-one, -on -one, and they will have a better understanding of what's going on. And they are asking me, what can we do? So that, we talked about this once before, but that 2015, you go home, you know something might be coming. And mm -hmm. you, you, you said your mother was doing what every Middle Eastern mother does, cooking for you. Yeah, you start yeah. breakfast, and then you start cleaning up, and you start lunch, and you start dinner, you know? like right. uh, um, And uh, you sit her down and your, and your father down and tell them what? Yes, I actually, yeah, uh, me and him talk, or, uh, talk about this uh, stuff before, but like I remember uh, I had a conversation uh, with my dad, with my mom, and with my, you know, siblings. I was like, look, I am, there's some things that are going to happen in our country and I'm going to be, uh, I will be talking about these issues and just because of I'll be talking about these issues, you guys might get <clears throat> affected. You know, and uh, your job might get affected, and you know your you know the, your loved ones might get affected. And then they said, hey, if you're on the right path, we got your back, right? And then uh, I remember I was it was the last day I was gonna come back to America. I get in a cab, and uh, in Turkey, we, in these apartments we have bal balconies, and my mom and my sister was standing in a, in a, you know on a, on a balcony, and I turn around. I was in a cab. I turn around. My mom and my sister was waving. I'm like, this is the last time I'm seeing my mom. And uh, my mom waved, I waved, and uh, I left. And that was the last time I saw my mom. That was back in 2015. And why did you know? How did you know? Because <clears throat> I know where this was going. I know that I knew that things were going to get more heat up. And I know that the Turkish government, or that they were not going to stop um, using your human rights violations. They were not going to stop, you know, jailers. Uh, jailing all this, you know, innocent people, especially political uh, prisoners and uh, journalists. You know, for you guys don't, who don't know that there are right now, Turkey is the number one country in the world that in the world that put most journalists in the jail, more than I think it was like China or something. Yeah. And um, there are, you know, 17 innocent thousand women are in the jail right now. And uh, if you look at all the reports, Amnesty International, Human Rights World, Human Rights Foundation, they are being getting you know, tortured, they've been getting raped, and that there are almost 1,000 babies are in the jail with their mothers growing up in jails. So I'm like, I saw this was coming, and um, I warned them, and I told them, I was like, if you guys got my back, I'm here. And then when you had to see that statement where they disowned you, and you yeah, knew the politics behind it, but, but what was the emotion? That was tough. That was tough because I was like, first I was thinking like, just because of I cannot call them and talk to them on, on the phone, I was like, first I was thinking like, hey, uh, they might do this so they can, so the Turkish government will leave them alone. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know. I still want to think that way. You know? Uh, I don't want to think the other way. But, well, and then I remember, I was like, I, th I thought my mom told me that he got, she got my back, but 
you know, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk with your siblings? Uh, the one in Spain, he, he plays basketball at uh, Badalona. So with him, yes. Um, with the other ones, no. no. Because, I mean, like I said, again, the, they track down everything, the phones, conversations, emails, and everything. So I talk to him, I always talk to my brother, and he sent me pictures of my dad and mom. I'm like, wow, that's, my mom's, you know, getting old, my dad gained weight. So I can, I always, I always see it like from the, from the, uh, from the pictures. Um, and, and that was 2015 when you sat them down. And that was two years after your sort of public initiation mm -hmm. into this activist world, right. which started with a tweet, right? What motivated you to do that tweet? And well, because the Turkish government was going around and shutting down schools. And I was like, I don't care what you're up to, what are you doing, but you cannot fight against education. So once there was like start, start of just closed down, you know, the, you know, the uh, schools and everything, uh, dormitories, universities, I was like, you know what, I gotta say, say something about that. You know, just because of, I had this platform, when I say something, it became a conversation, especially in, in the Turkey, you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd gone since the second grade to Hizmet schools, yes. right? Um, what, for the people who don't know that, what are those schools like? Um, <clears throat> well, the first of all, Hizmet means service, you know. Um, the, the schools that I was going into, uh, I was, you know, since the second grade, uh, you know, they, what really, like, amazed me about these schools, it doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter what your color is, your religion, your culture is. What I learned in the schools, the most important thing in life is leave your differences on the table and try and find what we have in common. You know, so once I came to America, I was like, wow, I'm lucky that I went to those, you know, those schools. And, um, you know, after that, so this school, you know, these people, this organization, the Hizmet organization, have schools over 170 countries in the world. And these schools are not just for Muslim or not just, it's not a religious school. You, you, you just can't go there and learn about, about math and science. In their math, at least in this country, the charter schools Everywhere. are math and science focused. Um, uh, so a lot of the controversy around um, your activism within Turkey right. has to do with Fethullah Gülen. Uh, can you uh, <clears throat> remind us of how you first connected with him? I know you went to the <coughs> schools that were part of his network, but how you first met him personally? I met him in America. Obviously, he lives in America. Well, just well, so for those who don't know, is he's talking about a person that he was one of the persons that just went. Turkish government was start doing this kind of issues. He was, and his organization was the only one to stand up against all the abuses that they were doing. And uh, I met him in America. Mm -hmm. And um, President Erdogan, when he was prime minister, was close with uh, Mr. Gulen. And then they had <clears throat> some kind of... People were always saying like they were close, but they were not really close. They only got together two times. One in a well, soccer game, another one was, I think it was a, a dinner or something. But there was some sense of cooperation. That's what the media wanted to, you know, just make it look like they were close, so, but they were never close. But there was no I cooperation? I actually asked them, but they, they were never close. So, uh, because early on in Erdogan's time, he was pushing some of the things that Mr. Gulan had been Mm -hmm. advocating for a while, right. sort of moving the country that mm -hmm. way, um, and then things have changed from there. Things have changed yeah. a lot, yep. So when you hear from, as you know, from the Turkish Consul General and others, they accuse you of being a spokesman for him and not for the people of Turkey. So what, what is your message to them? I was, my message to them, uh, listen, I was like, listen, if if talking about, if asking for freedom, if asking for democracy, if asking the freedom of all those political uh, prisoners, if asking uh, freedom of all those, you know, uh, women are in jail, innocent women are in jail, makes me a, a bad person, I am a bad person. Mm -hmm. That's my message to them. And they blame him for the coup in <clears throat> 2016. You said, managing the coup from mm -hmm. his compound in Pennsylvania, you said you were with him I was. that night, and what was he doing? Uh, well, he was just sitting on his chair and praying uh, for his country. That's literally just uh, all he did. Because I mean, obviously, uh, I was with him. And after the coup attempt, uh, when President Erdogan came out and blamed on the, you know, the Gilan movement, I was like, I was with him that night. So that's why I wanted to use that platform to talk uh, talk about these issues. So we're at a university campus where a lot of people here are dealing with right. international relations. What is your assessment <clears throat> of 
what's actually going on in Turkey? What, what, are the, what is the mechanics from someone who, who from your perspective, of what, is, what happened there? Um, well, I feel like President Erdogan just wanted to be the one-man show, and he only wants yes men around him. And uh, if you're against him, in any way, it's, it's in Turkey, it's his way or no way. You know, it's his way or in, in jail. So if you, especially if you have a, a platform, and if you talk about some of the uh, issues going on, you'll, you'll be in jail. It's not like in America that you can, you like the president or you don't like the president, but you can criticize mm -hmm. them, right? Because you have the freedom to do it. In Turkey, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in some other countries in the Middle East, it's not like that. You talk against the government or the regime that will make you a bad person. There are people in this country who uh, say what happened in Turkey could happen here. Um, do you see any evidence of that? And what, what is hyperbole and what is real when you look at it here? Mm -hmm. It's obviously it's what's happening in America is definitely sad. Uh, because like there's two parts, Republicans and Democrats, and they were just because of the social medias and everything that they were going, they're going at each other and they try to embarrass each other. I, I, I feel like they forget the main goal. The main goal is to make this country a better place to live in. And when you think about America, should, America should open up to our, their arms to everybody who is, you know, who's, uh, who's safe. And, uh, but now, just because of all that, you know, craziness going on and everything, I feel like they forgot, they, they forgot the uh, main goal. And so what, what is your suggestion from an, from an outsider who's here now, uh, and, but has that still that perspective of what people should be focused on and what they shouldn't be focused I on? I feel like the, the solution is right here, our you know, young generation. I feel like if we focus on what we need to focus on, if, we, if our focus is just trying to bring peace and love in our country, I think we're going to have a bright future. And uh, we can, only, we can only, uh, only do this with education. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when you try to look ahead now to your role, you want, you, you've said you want to use mm -hmm. your celebrity for good, um, uh, and you still have to play basketball right. and, and uh, focus on, right, right. Uh, on that. Uh, how do you manage those two, and wh what, do you, what do you think is, is worth leveraging right. your... I, I feel like basketball is my escape. You know, whenever I step on the court, it's all about me, my teammates, and just going out there having fun and trying to win a basketball game. You know, because if I bring any of these conversations, if I bring any conversations in the court with my teammates, and if it, if, if it affects me and my game, it will be very selfish of me. Because mm -hmm. it's a team sport, it's not an individual sport. If it affects me, it's going to affect my whole team. You know, I cannot bring this bring this, you know, this emotional or negative conversations in the locker room. Because it will, it will affect everybody. So mm -hmm. whenever I'm in this lock, in that locker room, whenever I'm in this, this step on that court, I f try to forget about everything. You know, it's all about my teammates, all about having fun, just going out there and just laugh and smile. But as soon as I step off the court, these conversations will come again. You can say, turn it off and on oh, yeah. like that? Well, we, you have to. Yeah. I feel like that's, been, that's, that's the one thing that I've been really working on because, I mean, not just these issues. I mean, obviously, we, we can have some, a lot of, like, family problems, girlfriend, boyfriend problems, this, that problems. But I feel like once we step on the court, we just need to turn that switch on and say, okay, this is just now. It's all about my team and my teammates. Yeah, because over the years when I've talked to other professional <clears throat> athletes, um, what, what I think is surprising the fans who are obsessed with it and the, with every moment on that is it can be kind of a lonely sort of world where you, right. in a very insular world where whether you're going back to your room to just play video games right, just to get right, away right. from it it, it, it can be sort of hermetically yes. sealed a little bit and you talk, you're seeing the same people but not many else and every else can be a trap or a threat and so um, so it's hard to be a public uh, activist right. and a successful yeah, emotion, emotional, especially if you're playing basketball, and the girls will know. But especially now, you have to deal a lot. And now with all the social media and everything, you play one bad game, or like you get dunked on, or I don't know, something will happen. <laughs> the whole world, you see, like you don't go. I see so many players. I'm not going to give any name. I see so many players get on their phone on Twitter in a halftime. That's yeah. that's wild. So like coach talks, so we have like 15 minutes, you know, break, right? 
So coach talks probably around like six minutes. Yeah. And then we go out there and warm up, right? And uh, I see so many players get on their phone and check Twitter. I see what people say about them. I'm like, oh my God, this is so... And they go out there, they have their like the worst probably worst, worst game of their career because it just messed up with, uh, with their head. So what are your social media rules? Um, well, I think just, if, you're, if you play a good game, you know, just get on social media, <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> then, 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 then there's no problem. <laughs> read, read all the covers, whatever, do whatever you want. But don't let it get, get, make it into your head. But I feel like if, you're playing, if you had a bad game or something happened that you get dunked on or whatever, or just you got blocked, or you missed the game winning shot, or, or anything. I just, I just say, hey, it just, it's, it's all about you and your teammates. Don't let all the distraction get into your head. Yeah. You know, it's just that little circle, 12, 13, 14, you know, players. So we don't let anyone get into that circle. Yeah. You don't lead all the haters because they're just sitting on their, you know, mom's basement and tweeting. Yeah. That's, little, that's little all they're doing. Yeah. And they don't know nothing about basketball. All they want is just watching and, and just playing it. it trust yeah. me, if they see uh, one of the players that they're talking, you know, uh, bad about, they will ask for an autograph oh, picture yeah. for sure. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, I was like that my first couple of years of my career. You know, I was like, I was the one guy that always gets on and just checks and what people say. I was like, you know, trying to troll the other players and stuff. But like, I'm like, you know what, this is it's just silly and you just need to, you know. So now you just check it. with the situation from the Jersey Shore and no one else. <laughs> <laughs> no, as long I, as he's okay, you're good. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I guess so. Brad Stevens has talked about the role you've played uh, with this team. Because right. last, last year you had a lot of talent on this team and mm -hmm. it was kind of a toxic locker room. Before you got there, it, there was a lot of yeah. personalities. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's lots of cameras here. I want to see myself on a House of Highlights, so literally for here. the next day. Yeah. <laughs> So um, can, but this year, so yeah. um, wh wh what do you see, um, you know, and, and what do you see your role as being a kind of mm -hmm. a, a presence that can kind of keep the, the, that, that teamwork? Yeah. I mean, well, you, you talk about talents. I mean, you can bring the, like, the most talented players in the league, but if they don't, if, they're, if their chemistry is not, don't click, and it's, not, it's just not going to work, you know, it's all about chemistry all about chemistry. So what we always trying to do is, you know, we always, you know, so if something happens, we always like try to go out to eat together or hang out together, go to a movie or do this. So we always like, because the better friends become, it's going to translation on the court, you know. I always try to keep it cool with my point guards. So those are the ones that get, gets me the ball. So I'm so cool with, I'm, I'm really, really cool, close with Kemba, obviously. <laughs> Marcus Smart, so I was like, keep always make a joke with him and hang out, try to hang out with him and stuff because those are the ones going to get you the ball. <laughs> but like, it's, but it's all about chemistry, man. Because like, what well, what we always do, I mean, well, obviously we have like different, different uh, players, different nationalities, different you know cultures, different religions. But what we try to do, we leave those on, uh, in a locker room. So whenever we go out there, we only talk one language, and it's basketball, and you know. I remember uh, it was, I'm not going to give it, uh, so I made the Western Conference Finals twice. The ones, I, uh, one time I made it, I remember like when things were going good, right, everybody was taking the blame, like, if something happened wrong, it was like, hey, if we, if we are up or by 20, and p people were saying, okay, it's my fault, it's my fault, but if we were down 20, people started like try to blame, try to blame each other and say, it's mm -hmm. your fault and your fault, and we lost the Western Conference Finals. Mm -hmm. And, um, but now this year, it's definitely different. With Brad's system, it's, it's unbelievable, you know? I have not seen uh, any drama yet. And yeah. it will be in March almost. And the system being what? What, for, for people who don't know? He trusts, he trusts his team, you know, yeah. his, his team. You know, he wants leaders. He doesn't want um, point guard to look, look at him every position and say, hey, what are we gonna run? You yeah. know, he wants, um, players to take responsibility and when it's their fault then he just said it's my fault you know mm -hmm. and um, all he cares about is just you know just uh, getting that you know being good friends and good uh, chemistry what is your sense right now of this team and how far it could go this year i mean I, of course our goal is to go out there and win a, a championship yeah. and i feel like i feel like we have every you know so every thing we need it yeah. We need to just go out there and uh, win that ring. Especially if Tatum has a few more games. Oh, he's been yeah, out. he's been unbelievable, man. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's always fu it's, it's fun, man, because like, when you have players like 
Tatum, Kemba, Gordon, uh, Jalen Brown, Gordon Haver. Like those are the games just becoming so easy. You mm-hmm. know, it just you just feeling so much comfortable and confident out there, both ends on the floor. Mm-hmm. You know, because, because like especially with Marcus Smart, man, his heart is I never seen a player like that ever. Yeah. yeah. You know, his heart. He's probably the one of the, the closest to the cage. Does he take everything seriously too? Like. Oh no, he's he's he gets a like, scratch on his sneaker. <laughs> <laughs> he's I, he's one of the. I did not know that he was that good of a, you know, person off the court. I know he was obviously he was he's a he's a monster on the court, but off the yeah. court, man, he's one of the best the best team that I had. That's great. What's it like to be stateless? You've said you're stateless. Yeah. You don't have a passport. Right. You have a green card. You, but what? Um. Does of that, course. Does that take a mental toll? You know, a lot of my. Actually, it's, it's pretty messed up. A lot of my teammates were, you know, making fun of me and saying, I'm homeless. <laughs> no, seriously, that, that was so, that's so messed up. <laughs> but it's, it's just like the, they know that I'm not going to take it serious. So they would just say, hey, man, you know you're homeless, right? <laughs> like, I know. But uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'll, I'll tell you a very f- a funny story. So, like, I think it was back in 2016 uh, or, se- sorry, 17, right? I started talking about these issues, right? I went to this like really big show called I think, like, Good Morning America or something, yeah. and uh, the lady over there asked me, "Is like so, so you, Turkish government just revoked your passport, so are you thinking about becoming an American citizen?" And I'm like, "Yes, I have, I'm a green card holder, so I have to wait five years, right?" And then she is like, "You know, if you marry with an American woman, it's only three years." <laughs> 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 No, she was not hitting on me. She was, <laughs> she was, she was too old. She was very old. But I'm like, I again, hope. there's lots of cameras here. So I <laughs> no, the, the, I, I just didn't give the person's name, so it's okay. But so it's a limited universe of people. Oh, <laughs> well, we can edit that, I hope. But anyway, I'm like, oh, that's very interesting because I never heard that rule before, yeah. right? So I'm like, it's very interesting. I did not know that. Thank you for you know sharing me that and stuff. So we're done with the. You know, uh, you know, the interview, and it was live. And then, and then I think I was done. I was looking at my phone. I have so many notifications <laughs> on my phone, right? I have so many marriage proposals on social media from like from everybody, yes. from just you know, they were just you know, they were actually taking a, a picture or video of their home and say, hey, this is my home. You can stay here. <laughs> no, not seriously. It was, it was it was wild. You don't have I, to be homeless. Yeah, I was like, that's so weird. But it just shows that I was. I'll take it that way. I was like, it just shows that how respectful, how nice and kind the American people are. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, delete it all. Delete yeah. all. Delete it all. <laughs> um, given. Given the, the very public role you've taken, given the controversy that you sometimes have right. to deal with, what is dating like for you? You said that you, you, have, to, you have to be conscious of that. Yeah. I mean, j- just, just, because of, um, so just because of the platform we had and everything we have, so you don't know that what the other persons are intentions. You know, so yeah. you have to be very careful of who you are hanging out with, or who you you know dating with, or because they don't know if they, you they are marrying uh, you for yourself, or for your money, or for your fame, or for the attention, or for the, the NBA world, whatever. Right. And um, so I always try to be careful. And they don't know if you're marrying them for the I'm citizenship. Sing- I'm single. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> um, you, you've talked before about. Uh, an interest after basketball in politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, how serious are you about that? And what form, what attracts you uh, to political life? Uh, well, just be, if you don't put good there, there's going to be bad, you know? So I was like, you know what, just because of, I'm in D.C. probably every once every two months, trying, you, know, um, you know, hanging out, I don't want to say hanging out, but meeting with, you know, the senators and congressmen and, and congresswomen. So, and just when I sit down and talk to them, and you know, even like some of them said, like, "Hey, you have a, you know, a feature in this." I was like, first I was I wasn't taking it really serious, but and then I was like, you know what? I think it could be a, a career for sure. What have you learned about politics and the media since you've been from from the other side? You you have a different perspective from the one that most professional athletes have, which is there's the media, politics is on the other side, and here we are in this world here. You're now 
going and lobbying and meeting with politicians, finding out who's effective, who gets yeah. things done, who talks. Um, and also, you've you know, written uh, quite a number of op-ed pieces, mm -hmm. uh, including for The Globe and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, what have you learned about both politics and the media and what, what they're doing right <coughs> and what they're doing wrong right now? Uh, well, I mean, when I, with, with my situation, when I sit down and talk to them, when I start the conversation, they always stop me in the middle, middle and say, hey, don't worry about it, we already know this stuff. We already know your situation, how can we help you? And that gives me so much hope and that makes me actually uh, very happy. What they're doing wrong, I was, like, like I said again, I feel like we, we, sh we should only have one goal and try to bring peace and love in this country. And I feel like if we uh, get distracted, that's a bad way, mm -hmm. very bad. Yeah. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions in a minute now, so uh, I guess people will be um, going around. Um, uh, do you, again, with the, with the students here that you said are the, the future here, <coughs> what's your advice for them about how to be effective. Uh, you know, we have a situation right mm -hmm. now in this country because of social media right. uh, where there's a lot of yelling at each other and a lot yeah. of being right and th there's less effort, it seems, at persuasion, trying to move people towards your camp. You're practicing persuasion. That's what you're trying right. to do now. What's your advice to them about how to do that? I, w I will say just because of like the, all the social media and, and you know and everything, I feel like we need to use this platform. And if that pl platform giving you talk about the right things, you know. And um, I, I was trying to educate my, because basketball, I'm only gonna play this basketball for 14, 15 years, you know. And that's like the little, just little part of my life. So I need to uh, learn about what's going on. So when I talk about these issues, it can become a kind of conversation, you know, maybe foreign affairs or, relationship between America and some of the other countries and what's going on in America. And this is not even my say, second language, but uh, I see like when I, whenever we hang out with our teammates, sometimes, you know, they go out there hanging out in clubs and doing all that stuff. I go home and try to read. I go home and try to learn, learn about how can we, how can I explain myself better? Because just because we have this uh, platform, yeah. all those uh, young people out there, kids especially, are idolizing whoever at the platform. So I feel like if we do the right thing, they're gonna follow our footsteps. But if we do the wrong, wrong stuff, then that's a big problem. And you told me before that playing in Boston is, is different. Yeah, that, for sure. That people I was come very, up to you. Yeah, yeah. I was very happy that, you know, I, when I sang with the Boston, because like the cities I played for before, and you know, people used to come up to me, I was like, oh, hey, good game last night, or good double-double, good this and that. But now Boston, just because it's a very educational and influential town, they come and say, oh, hey, good article yesterday, or good op-ed yesterday, <laughs> or hey, we saw, we saw this, we saw that, we read this, and then I can sit down and have a conversation with them. Um, but I think it's, just, it's, it's definitely a blessing to be in this situation, especially in Boston. That's great. All right, other questions? All right, so I think there are people with microphones coming around. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so my intramural basketball team, we've got one open spot. Um, we've got a game next Wednesday. I was wondering if you'd be interested in joining us to take that, that W together. Um, first of all, is your, what's your jersey says in the back? Okay, good. <laughs> Leave your number, I might come then. <laughs> all right, all right. Appreciate that. All right, we got some down here. Uh, thank you. So, um, huge fan of yours, huge Boston Celtics fan. Um, made a bet with some friends, you know, who was going to sign after Al Horford left. Um, and, and you just got signed, so it was like pretty cool. Um, I said you were going to get signed. So. Um, so, I got my green card when I was eight years old, and I remember the first thing that my family did is we went to Canada, right? It was like this huge thing, we just kind of like yeah, got it sure. and we went to Canada, it was like awesome. And so, um, I remember reading an article about how you got help from Justin Trudeau to, um, you know, get to the Christmas Day basketball game. Yeah. I was just, you know, wondering what emotions were going through your head and all that. 
Well, first, actually, this year with the Boston Celtics, um, it, was the, my, it was my first time that I left country in probably three something years. It was the first time I left mm. the country. Don't get me wrong, America's been amazing. But uh, you still want to get out of the country and go to other places, right? Yeah. And uh, this year, it was the first time that I left you know, the country when I stepped on Canada. I was like, it smelled like freedom. You know, I was like, you know what, this is so amazing to just, you know, just come in here and you know, just, you know, just play bad because my job, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a pol politician. My job is to play basketball, especially going out there, playing on a Christmas day, huge blessing. To just go out there and having fun with my teammates, it was definitely uh, very amazing. It was very emotional uh, for me for, for sure. But uh, Justin Trudeau's office, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's office has been, you know, helped me a lot. So I was, uh, I was very, you know, uh, blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Yep. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ayub. I'm a senior here at Tufts. Uh, first, I just want to apologize that you had to play for the Knicks. On behalf of all Celtics fans, we welcome you to Boston. <laughs> I'm looking at the cameras. <laughs> if they have no cameras, I'll leave you some stories, but we have a lot of cameras. Turn off the cameras. Um, so my question is, um, you mentioned some of your teammates saying like, oh, you're crazy for like speaking out. Um, now in 2020, how have some of your teammates, especially being on the Celtics with, you have teammates like Jalen Brown who are like yes. very active uh, in activism in general. How have they been supporting you now? It's been amazing to see how much support I get from my, not just my teammates, from the coaches, you know, from the, you know, uh, from the fans, especially. You know, one, the one they breast him and said, hey, I know what's going on. In your world, so if you want to take a, you know, day off of practice, just let me know. I might use it, <laughs> or just, just. But it just, it just, like you said, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, those guys are like knows what's going on, and Kemba Walker. I actually, uh, when my passport got revoked, I got texts from Russell Westbrook and Stephen Adams, and that they were asking me how, how am I doing and stuff. So it just. It's amazing to see, so we just, it's just amazing to see how much support I get from all those people and those people, these people have some like huge platforms. And uh, Jalen, a couple months ago, I think Jalen Brown posted something on his um, Instagram and you know, just he posted a picture of me and says freedom uh, for all. So it definitely meant a lot to me because seeing your teammate uh, supporting you that way is definitely huge. Okay. Way back. Hey, Ennis, uh, it's good to see you again. I'm not sure if you remember, we, we worked together over at uh, Niagara in Chicago with uh, Hadith and Hilmi oh, and Rana okay. and those folks, so it's amazing to see you again. I wanted to let you know that one of the reasons I ended up coming here to Tufts to study was because of my experience there, so really kind of serving in Hizmet with you guys was, was a huge honor, so thank you for, for keep on being out there. I wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit more about Hizmet, the religious component of it, and kind of what it's meant to you over the years as you've, you've gone forward a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, the, the, the one thing I will say is definitely it, it is all about education. You know, this, uh, this organization has schools uh, over 170 countries in the world like we uh, talk about. And these schools are not just for religious, pe uh, religious people. It can, you know, you can, be, you can be a Jew, you can be a Christian, a Muslim. You believe in God, you don't believe in God. You can go to the schools and learn about, learn about math and science. And this organization believes in dialogue, you know. So, like I said before, it doesn't matter what your background is or religion or whatever. We should only talk about one thing is peace and love, and that should be our main goal. So, it's just, um, like I said again, with dialogue and education, we can definitely have a, a bright future. How are you at math and science, given all this math and science? Not really good. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm actually opening up a school in, uh, yeah, in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma so, City, yeah. and uh, people like a lot of my teammates will give me a lot, lot of, you know, say, you didn't even finish college. You only went to college for one year. <laughs> I'm, not, but I, I'm, just, I'm doing this for, obviously, because, I mean, America gave me so much, right? America gave me so much, and I want to be, I want to give back to America. And the best way to give back to America is education, you know, because invest in our, Benjamin, I think Benjamin Franklin said this quote, I think invest in our futures gives the best interest. And um, I feel like there's a really good quote that who, uh, he, who, he, or she, or who opens a um, school door, closes a, a prison. You know, I feel like uh, the best thing that we can give our younger 
generation is education. And why Oklahoma City starting there? Because I, I know the symposis centers there. I know a lot of congressmen there. I played there two and a half years. I went to Western Conference Finals there. So, you know, the pe people over there just, you know, they uh, the supported me so much. So that's why I wanted to start, start there. Okay. Question? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. You're next. Hello, my name is Mohammed, and I was wondering if you could talk about more what it was like practicing your faith of like Islam while you're playing basketball, you know, like prayers and like, especially with Ramadan coming up and fasting. Well, it's not tough at all, especially in America, because people respect each other so much. So one thing we, I always do with my teammates, I never judge my teammates or, you know, they never judge me. I always try to learn, you know, what they believe and they always try to learn what I believe. So if we learn from each other, we can have a better conversation. Uh, there's so many times that when I went to, you know, my, uh, my hotel room, I open up and start reading a uh, Bible. And so, so because once we, when we start having, you know, just one-on-one -on -one conversation with my teammates, so I can ask them, uh, you know, better uh, good and good uh, questions. But, um, you know, it just, it's not tough at all because, like I said again, people in America respect, you know, that so much. Like, like I said again, like, with, you know, Oklahoma City, with New York Knicks, with Boston Celtics, you know, they gave me halal food. They gave me uh, room for praying both in a practice facility and where we uh, play. And, um, you know, they always been respectful so much, but the only, only thing they want to see is just respect back. Okay. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I've been watching basketball for, like, all my life. And um, one thing I've, I've noticed recently is how basketball is a, a huge American brand, but it has um, a very strong international presence. And it, it feels like, especially recently, a lot of those um, thoughts, ideas, identities come into conflict a lot. Um, do you see perhaps where the NBA is or it's trying to promote its international presence in a way that's um, pro-social, in ways that it's uh, doing more humanitarian efforts and more philanthropic work um, internationally? And if not, what are some ways that you think the NBA can accomplish that? I think so, because I mean, like, not, now we, we always see like the, we have this, you know, the practice, I don't want to say practice games, but like we go to, like say some, I don't go, but like my teammates or like the, the other teams just can go, you know, they, they go to Mexico to play, play an exhibition game or to China or London or like some other India. They just went to, uh, recently two teams. But like that, that definitely extends the game and makes it more, not just in America, more, makes it more international, makes, makes it more uh, globally. So I think it's just NBA has been doing an amazing job by you know, extending uh, this game. Just building on that, that international uh, profile that the NBA has, better than any other professional sport, but we saw that come into conflict with, with Hong Kong and, yeah. and, and, and you, you reminded people about that when that was, a, that was a, uh, surprising to a lot of people that how much the biggest names in basketball yeah. um, sided with Beijing over the democracy activists in Hong Kong. Did that surprise you and what do you think is at play there? I will say this, I mean, I, I mean NBA been, did an amazing, obviously like the NBA did an amazing job and they just said, hey, we are standing up for freedom and they can, whichever um, player want to say something, it's, it's open to say. And I mean, I was like, it, it amazed me because I mean, the, like what, after what, you know, they're more did NBA lost millions and millions, but NBA still said we are standing up for freedom and every player open to say whatever they want to say. But that wasn't the initial reaction though. The initial reaction was, we got to worry about the. Well, that's that's, it, that's individual. You know, so some of the players, you know, decided to not say anything. So you cannot, you know, control the players, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Question. Hi, Anas. Huge fan. Um, I just want to. I, I remember reading uh, a piece you wrote, uh, an opinion piece you wrote for Fox News the day after the late Kobe Bryant passed away. And I just wanted to ask how um, your experiences with him and how, what you learned from him with his mentality, whether it be on the court or you know setting up these youth sports programs, you know giving back to his community, and you know 
being perfected in this craft has like impacted your your will and your you know your yeah. determination you know also excel on the court and do as best as you can but also you know pursue your own you know your own humanitarian goals mm -hmm. well we were just in a couple i think it was like three four days ago we were just at in uh, la with kobe's memorial and you see like all the like the you know basketball player ex-basketball players celebrities and all the people came i was like you know what he affected so many people in a positive way and uh I was the one thing about Kobe, man, is just his, like, when, you're, when you're a kid, if you take a shot, you're screaming Kobe. <laughs> you know, when you yell, you see screaming Kobe. But I think it's just one, one thing what he made is his legacy is now big, way bigger than basketball. Because not just on the court, but what, what he did off the court is just extending his brand while he was playing. But now it's like, it was just so emotional and it was just so, uh, you know, hard to, you know, of course, just to see that happen for sure. But like Kobe was, it was, I never seen a player that dedicated and that disciplined. And you always hear that about like that 3, 4 a.m. practices, right? I'm like, why? Just get your sleep in. And you just, <laughs> no, seriously, get, just get your sleep in. Just go to practice at 11, right? But his men's mentality was always so different, man. He was a different, different beast. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember he, him, he came, he came to Turkey. And when I was like, what, when I was 19 years old, it was the first time that I'm, I'm, I was seeing him. I was just so, you know, just so nervous to even just meet him. And then he gave me some couple tips about how to, you know, take care of my body and um, actually mess with my body, you know, always stretch, eat right, sleep well, and uh, just always try to do some yoga and Pilates and all that stuff. And I remember my first regular season game was against, you know, against Lakers at Staples Center. And Kobe turned around and said my name. I'm like, oh wow, that actually just it gives me it gives me chills. It gave me uh, chills. And um, but I think just you know losing him that way just hurt everybody, not just the you know the sports world. It definitely affected and hurt everybody. And um, I first time I heard that news, I just didn't want to believe it. I thought my friend was just messing with me. And uh, once I saw that he got confirmed that it was really him, and it happened. <clears throat> And I was just speechless. You know, when sometimes you have those moments that you just, you just numb. You don't feel anything, and it just, it, I was, I was like that because he, he meant so much to our NBA. I was the WNBA too. He meant his, you know, his daughter. So it was just very emotional. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yes, here, right here. Sorry. Oh, you can be next. <laughs> Uh, hi, Ines. Uh, what would you say the biggest lesson uh, basketball has taught you of life, and what has life taught you about basketball? Hmm. What basketball taught me is probably just, you know, stay disciplined and uh, sacrifice. Prob that two thing just really, uh, it's my ninth year in the league. Probably staying disciplined is one of the hardest things because obviously you live in an NBA life, right? You want to be. You wanna you just you wanna go out. You wanna just do some do some stuff. We all know, you know. Just it it just when you see like the players like Kobe or LeBron or someone like the you know like the best basketball players in the world, see how they live. It just it was it's just so fascinating how they take care of their body. I I, for, I think it was last year I heard that you know LeBron spends like one and a half million dollar or something on his body every year like massage, food, this, and then I'm like, wow, this is it's wild. And, um, it's a small percentage, though. It's a, for him, it's a literally small percentage, but, like, but still. <laughs> but the, the, the second thing, the sacrifice. Sacrifice was definitely the, the second thing, because like, obviously, um, basketball players, you guys all know that we want to go out there and play, what, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 35 minutes, and take a lot of shots, right? But it's, it won't happen. It's not happening every, every time, every night. And uh, what basketball taught me sacrifice is it doesn't matter you played five minutes or 30 minutes. You're going out there not just for yourself, for your teammates and for the fans. So whatever coach gives you, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, just go out and give yourself 100%. And when I had so many teammates, I, it's very sad, but I have so many teammates. When we lose, but when they have a good game, they were happy. And when we win, and when they had a bad game, they were not happy. And that it was, it was, it was just shocking to me. Mm -hmm. So, so sacrifice is just sacrifice, and 
your own you know, emotions for your teammates is definitely what the basketball taught me. And what life, you said what life taught me in basketball? Um, I'm trying to think. What life taught me in basketball? What do you guys think? You guys play basketball player, right? <laughs> you guys have any answers? <laughs> no? Well, I think what you said before is that life taught you that basketball is only this. Yeah, and yeah, like, like you said, that basketball is only like maybe 14, if you're lucky, if you take care of yourself, maybe 14, 15 years. I was, when, when I have a basketball camp with little kids, I was asked like, so when you're done playing basketball, what are you going to do? They always stay quiet. I'm like, you can, I was like, you cannot just go and play Fortnite all day. <laughs> <laughs> or now it's like we have lots of like people. Like, you cannot just go home and make TikTok videos all day. Am I right? <laughs> so we have to be able to just get another career yeah. because once you're done with the 30, 34, 30, 35, then you have a if you I mean if you live. I mean, average person life is like 65, 70, right? You have another 30, 35 years. Yeah, hopefully. Figure it out. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. I might check out earlier. Yeah. I don't have a million and a half on my body. Yeah, sure. true. All right, I think we have time for. The, what, I promised you a question. Hi, Ennis. Thanks for uh, making the time and being here tonight. Um, so, playing on a team like the Celtics, which has so many rookies and young players, I'm sure you're expected to act as a mentor a lot of times. Um, do you try to instill sort of this idea of? knowing the issues going on in the world and in the community and sort of teaching the younger players to get involved in those sort of things? Or how do you sort of treat mentorship in the locker room with younger players? I never go up to them and try to teach them anything. You know, if they have a question for me, they can come and ask me and we sit down and talk, talk about it. Because I, know, I don't know, I don't want them to feel like I'm trying to force, force them to, you know, learn something about me or about anything. So, I mean, most of the time they always have I come with a question for me and they come and sit down and talk to me. I'm like, okay. And then they usually ask me like, okay, you've been playing in the league for nine years. How did you do it? How did you take care of your body? Or when did you sleep? Or when you hit that rookie wall, especially the rookies, what did you do? Or when you have a bad game, how did you just, you know, just move on to the next one? So it's just like, it's the conversations that, but if it brings like any, like deeper conversations, then I'll just I'll sit down and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. All right, last question, I think. Who's got a really, really good closer question? Put your hands down if it's not a great question. <laughs> She's been asking for a really bad right, Yeah, right, go right, ask her, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Hi, Anas, huge fan. Um, it's kind of a cheesy question, but... Okay, then, put the, then sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, I'm just kidding. Guys. Um, I'm a sophomore currently, so I'm like, you know, I, I don't, I like a lot of kids here going through the process of trying to figure out what they want to do in life, what they're passionate about. How would you recommend finding, you know, finding a way to find your passion or what you're interested in, like to the degree that you realize you are so passionate about basketball? I will just, I will just say this. If you're a, if you're a parent, don't let your kid, so just, just I'm going to say I'm a parent, right? And I love football. I want my kids to play football just because of, I like football, but my kids like basketball. So just because of I like football, I'm forcing my kids to play, you know, football. I, I, I always say like respect the kids and ask them what they want to do. And once they say, hey, I want to do basketball, I want to ballet, I want to do this, like even like the weirdest can always try to respect them. I feel like just they take him and try to understand him as, an, as, a, as a, you know, as a, as a kid is just very important because it will affect them later in life and just it's, just make them do something they love. You know, it's always nice to just see them smile, especially the kids. So I, I always say just try to have a conversation with them and ask them what they want to do, not what you want to do or what the parents want to do. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. And fortunately, we're, we're out of time. But uh, uh, thank you so much for all your Thanks time. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, Last thing I'm gonna say. Okay. So this morning, right? This morning I was talking to Coach Brad, and Coach Brad is like, "So I heard that you're going to a, a tough university and going to give a talk." I'm like, "Yes." And he's like, he's like, "Make sure you just keep it short." I'm like, "Why?" Because said you're going to a university and it's Friday night. <laughs> you know? I'm like, just make sure you keep it very short. I'm like, "I got you, Coach." Exactly. <laughs> 
So I'm sorry if you guys have to go somewhere or if you guys wanted to do something. I'm sorry I take you too much of your time. But uh, well, I guess just the night's early. The Enjoy night's it. early. Hey, it's a long night. <laughs> oh God, I remember my college colleges now. You done? Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it.